Psalm 118, verse 24 says, This is the day the Lord has made. We will, and I capitalize that, we will rejoice and be glad in it. Every day we have a choice. We can be under the dark cloud of depression, or we can get up and say, Today's your day, Lord. This is the day you have made. I will. I choose to rejoice and be glad in it. And uh, that's for my wife and I. So we have a, a, a small crew here today. I think I may ask them if I can have a drummer next week. <laughs> a couple of singers, keyboard player. Can't hurt to ask. Um, you know, we're not trying to violate any rules or anything, but it, it really does help, obviously, to, um, to make a joyful noise to the Lord. Even though Jesus didn't even have a microphone, and he did pretty well for himself, so we're not saying it's required. Uh, but, like I said, it doesn't hurt to ask. And then um, it says in Psalm 118, verse 17, this is the post I put up on Facebook this week, I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. Would you say that with me? I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. Say it again. I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. That's what we have to remember. Amen? That his life is inside of us. I quoted it earlier. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is alive in us. He's the God who calls those things that are not as though they are. And we've been hearing for months and months now how this is the decade of the decree, how this is a weapon, our praise is a weapon, our mouth is a weapon, our voice is a weapon. I've encouraged our congregation to look at one of the videos that we have posted on our YouTube channel uh, by Dutch Sheets, which... Uh, talks about how the Word of God is the sword of the Spirit, but he really does a beautiful job of breaking down what the Word means there. It's not a sword until you speak it, okay? I'm not going to try to reteach it. You can watch it. It says the sword of the Spirit is the spoken Word of God, if you're, if you're looking for that video. Um, I also just want to encourage you um, to go back and watch the March 8th, service that we have posted on our website as well when Chuck Pierce was here. So March 8th, we weren't in the uh, kind of current status that our country is in where there's so many new rules popping up every day of what we can't do and how we have to restrict our movement. We were still allowed to meet that day and there was just hundreds of people here and Chuck prophesied and he also blessed us for our move going to the Fellowship Deaconry which was scheduled to happen on May 1st. We don't know when the meetings are going to start, but we're still planning to move forward on that. And um, what happened to me when I re-listened to it this week in light of all the things that have happened with the global coronavirus, it really puts a whole new light on the prophecies that he gave that day and how incredibly accurate he has been all the way back to September when he first talked about plague-like situations coming, but he also put the condition on it back in September that it was only going to go through April, okay? Now, if you need something to hold on to, you hold on to that because we trust the prophet. God reveals things to the prophets first, and we're believing. And you don't have to know how God's going to do it. There are things that you could think of in the natural that could happen where this thing could die. God could curse that thing, and it could die. He's done it throughout history. So don't try to figure out how. Just trust the prophet and believe God and stand on that word. And, you know, we like to joke around a little sometimes and say for people in ministry, some, are, some just went, but some are sent. And the other beautiful thing about that time with Chuck was that we were sent. We got the blessing to go, and it just really confirmed to me that this is, that God has been on this move, even though we haven't physically fully moved over there yet. So I just want to encourage you, if you're part of our congregation and you're part of our family, to don't stop giving to the move because we have a war chest we're building over there. Things are going beautifully. A lot of people got to go there um, that next Sunday after Chuck was here on the 15th, which would have been last Sunday, we got to go into the building together and pray. And it was just the next day that the rules came out and said, um, at first, no more than 50 people and then, you know, what the current rules are now. So the timing has just been amazing. We had over 100 people in the chapel praying, even though it's a construction site, we had approval to be in there. And um, it was just so cool that the Lord worked out the timing this way. So this would not be the time that we would normally take the offering. So I'm going to ask the three people that are here to just come up and 
No, I'm just kidding. They have to be on the board. But, you know, we still have the U.S. mail is working. We still have online giving. Our website is, um, has multiple ways that you can give, text to give, tithely. You can donate right on our Facebook site as well. And um, our bills don't go away just because we're not able to meet together. And look, God's not a beggar. I'm not going to be a beggar. But I do want to also point you to another teaching from Chuck this week. Okay, he's our covering. He's our oversight. And he's also an extremely accurate prophet. It seems like every year that goes by, he gets more accurate. Because the other thing he did this week is he taught about the power of the principle of ransom. He called it the law of ransom in the Bible. It wasn't well known to me until I heard him teach it. And then I went and looked it up. Again, I'm not going to reteach his message. It's right on our YouTube channel. It's also on our Facebook page. And it says the power of the law of ransom. And it's about this year's Passover, 2020, Exodus and Passover, same thing. In Christian circuits, we call it Easter. It's a great celebration time, but it goes all the way back to the Moses leading the people through the Red Sea. So um, don't lose the point that Chuck is making in there is that it would be easy for fear to let you to stop giving. He said, but the reason the plague came on David many years later is because he didn't go back and inquire of the law and recognize that if he took a census, that he would also have to give an offering. And the plague came because David didn't follow the order. That's the point Chuck is making. He said it was really very similar to when David first went for the Ark of the Covenant when it was in Obed-Edom's house and forgot to consult what the law said. If he had consulted the law, he would have known that it only could be carried by priests on poles, but he didn't. He took a shortcut, and he went and got the Ark, and we know what happened. It was on a, it was on a cart, and somebody tried to touch it to hold it from falling, and they were struck dead because that was against God's law. And, you know, David repented of that sin, and he went back and looked. And, and Chuck's point is that we, are, we could be hijacked into thinking we have to stop giving now. Don't do it. Don't do it. it. It removes a blessing. We don't want that. We want the blessing. Continue to give. He teaches it better than I just did, but um, I, I really think it's important if you're part of our tribe that you understand uh, that principle. Anybody really should understand that principle. So I'm going to just by faith say hold up that offering if you have a check in your hand, however you're choosing to do it, because we want to just pray for the offering. We thank God that he's Jehovah Jireh. He's the God of provision. <sighs> Amazing provision. He owns it all. Thank you, Lord, for the ability that you give us to think clearly, like we sang, that we're no longer slaves to fear. We've been delivered from that. You haven't given us a spirit of fear, but you've given us power and love and a sound mind. And we operate in that even in the marketplace as, as difficult and as disrupted as the marketplace is. Lord, we thank you that you help us to find favor in the marketplace. You give us ideas. We pray that you would download solutions to this coronavirus to the biologists and the chemists and the people that are working on these problems and trying to solve a way to defeat this. We say you are greater than the coronavirus. Your crown rules over the crown of coronavirus. And we thank you for the principles in the word of God that you said that you've given us the ability to get wealth in order that your, estab your covenant might be established here in the earth. We receive that. We receive that promise, Lord. We lift up that offering before you. And we say, use it mightily. In this time when people are desperate, Lord, use these funds mightily that the word might get out to desperate people that don't know you, that they would learn of your goodness like we sang about today, that they would receive you as a personal Lord and Savior, be delivered from fear, be healed in their spirit, and receive eternal life. Lord, we say, use this offering mightily for your purposes. In Jesus' name, amen. So that is um, important for us to focus on because we're in the midst of a move. Thank you so much to all the volunteers that came two Saturdays ago. We moved so much stuff from the church over to the deaconry and our new offices. We'll, we'll take it a day at a time. We keep sending out information in social media on our website about that move. And as a lot of you know, everything's been disrupted, so I won't go into all that detail. But the plan is right now to live stream only. Still on Tuesday nights, there may be another day or two that we do it. I don't know. As like I said, we're just going to play that by ear. And um, we'll continue to share the good news of the gospel, right? 
It's, it's not good advice, it's good news. <laughs> it's not a way to live, it's taking on a savior and, and submitting yourself to him every day, to his lordship. So that first verse that I read on that cover um, said, I shall not die but live. I said that was um, from Psalm 118, 17. A lot of you know that the Psalms are songs, just like we sang just now. These were the book of Psalms. There's 150 different songs that Israel sang, and that they would get together during the feasts every year, and they would sing these Psalms together, and it, and it gave them a core identity. And it helps us today too, right? Psalm 23 is read constantly at funerals because it says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Right? I will fear no evil, for you are with me. That's what you need to remind yourself now. We do not have to fear evil, for God is with us. We're his children. He loves us. He's not a distant, angry God waiting to punish us. He's a loving father, Abba Father. I will fear no evil, for you are with me, Lord. That gives us peace in our soul. Even though an enemy might be encamped around about me, he prepares a table for me, even in the presence of my enemy. That's the protective covering that our God gives us. So there was another part of this particular psalm, which is uh, a proclamation that I shall not die but live and declare the works of the Lord. When I have a testimony of being delivered or being healed, I live to declare the, the works of the Lord, the miracles of God, how my life was completely turned around by God in interceding in my life and, and that divine intervention in my life prevented me from dying and is causing me to live. And now for the rest of my life, I want to live to declare the works of the Lord. So another part of that psalm, just right before that, it says, songs of joy and victory are sung in the camp of the godly. Here comes the warfare. It's not so easy to sing songs of victory when you're hunkered down in the bunker and you're not allowed to leave your house. In the natural, there's lots of reasons to be upset and to be fearful, but that's not how the Lord does it. He says, right here in the psalm, songs of joy and victory are sung in the camp of the godly. That's what we do. We sing songs of joy and victory. When God wanted to win a battle, he sent worshipers first. When David brought the ark back into Jerusalem, he was dancing, so much so that his wife was embarrassed for him. And he said, oh, really? You think that was bad? I will be even more undignified than this because I'm celebrating that the presence of God is back in the middle of the camp again. This is how we have to live. David said, I will bless the Lord at all times, even in the midst of coronavirus, I will bless the Lord. It's not conditional on whether things are going well for me or not. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be in my mouth. This is the power of the decree. All your promises, Lord, are yes and amen. Faithful you are. <laughs> Faithful forever you will be. Trust God. Amen. Just keep saying it out loud. There's something about the power of our words Death and life are in the power of our words. As you sing scripture, as you sing Christian songs, don't sing it silently to yourself. Speak it out into the atmosphere. Your spirit hears yourself singing it, and it reinforces your spiritual immune system so that you won't be hijacked by fear. All right, 15 said, songs of joy and victory are sung in the camp of the godly. The strong right arm of the Lord has done glorious things. The strong right arm of the Lord is raised in triumph. The strong right arm of the Lord has done glorious things. You could do a lot worse than focusing on those verses. And that's where, in verse 17, it says, I will not die. Instead, I will live to tell. And some versions say, the wonders of the Lord, the glorious works of the Lord, the miracles of the Lord. That's what we're believing for. So um, I'm sure you would understand that in the last couple of weeks, in my dual role, I, I work in the stock market. I always have for the last 20 years since we started the church. I, I've, I've had my foot in the marketplace as well as here at the church. And we've been through other financial crises before. And this one is shaping up as one. It doesn't have to be a long-term one if there's a quick solution. And there still could be a quick solution. 
Um, I'm not meaning to talk about economics and finance right now. I'm just saying that we're in a disruption. People are very worried about their finances, about being not being told they can't go to work. Business owners that are told that they're not allowed to operate their businesses. It's a form of, of almost like martial law. And they have, the bills don't go away, but if I can't open the doors to my business, and what about unemployment and all these other things? So really could be easy to be hijacked by fear. And God knows everything about us, right? He suffered. He knows everything about us. He took on our flesh, just like we talked about during communion today. He knows what we go through. So you need to bring those concerns and those fears to him and say, Lord, I need you to help me. I need to offload this. And he said that. Bring your burden to me. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Bring all the things that are weighing you down and bring it to me, and I will give you rest. And that's what we need. Because even scientifically, you can see that when you're stressed out, your natural immune system goes down. It's a tactic of the enemy to make you sick. Stress causes sickness. I won't, again, I'm not going to practice medicine without a license here, but this is proven. You need the peace of God in your heart, not be hijacked by all the news and, and the constant flow of scary things that are going on around us. You know, we are protected. He sings songs of deliverance over us. We just said that today. So I was getting a lot of calls and making a lot of calls to clients during the last two weeks since things have really started to go haywire there. And um, naturally for the church as well. Lots of prayer requests, lots of people that need prayer and need help, and that's what we're here for. That's what we do. And you have to be like David was. It says that he encouraged himself in the Lord. You may remember this. When uh, he went out with his army, the enemy came and ransacked the city of Ziklag and took all his possessions and their wives and children. And when he came back, his men wanted to stone them. Stone him, sorry, as the leader. And uh, it says so strongly, it's such an important encouragement for us that David encouraged himself in the Lord. That's what we have to do right now. That's the kind of battlefield mentality that we're in right now. No matter what's going on around us, we take our strength from the true north. The compass of God is pointed to the true north. And Lord, we don't know what the future holds, but we know that you hold our future. And we're not going to allow our faith to fail here. It says, Jesus said, when I come back, will I find faith in the earth? It says about his hometown, he could do no miracles there because of their unbelief. That's a stronghold. That's, that's a, a stronghold against our ability to walk in faith. You have to make some tough decisions. You're not going to make good decisions if you're hijacked by fear. You have to be at peace. We had a friend, John Paul Jackson. I'm sure a lot of you know who he was. He passed away. But when he was here speaking with us, he said, peace is the potting soil of revelation. It sounds like it's almost a proverb. It's not from the Bible, but it's a brilliant thought that we need revelation now more than ever because we're facing decisions we haven't ha had to face before. So if you're not at peace, you're going to make bad decisions. So Probably the main scripture I've quoted in the last couple of weeks since all this has started to be so prevalent on people's minds is this portion of scripture. I started saying it because of the panic that happened in the market so early. And I realized that the Lord, the Holy Spirit, just quickened this portion of scripture to me because the book of Hebrews has always been very special to me. It's not an easy book to understand, but it's really rich. And in Hebrews chapter 2, I'll, I'll read it from this translation. It says, uh, 2.14, because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood. All right, I'm just going to stop there for a minute. Go back to the original plan of God back in Genesis. And we know that God put Adam and Eve in the garden that were made in his image. And that he made us man and woman in his image, and we are to reproduce after his kind. That was God's plan, right? He wanted fellowship with us. The unlimited power of God was now put into a body of limitation to express himself that way. When they sinned, actually what the devil said to Adam and Eve was, you won't die. If you eat from this tree, you will not die. And they didn't die as soon as they ate it, but they brought death into the kingdom. Okay, so that's the big failure 
in the garden that allowed sin to come into the world. And we know from the New Testament that it says the wages of sin is death. So they didn't die when they ate the fruit, but they brought death into the kingdom. And from that point on, a war was established between God and the sin of humanity. And the only way around that sin of humanity is through Christ. It's through the sacrifice that we just celebrated when we took communion. No other thing can redeem us but the blood of Jesus, that substitutionary death that he took for us. We deserve the punishment. He took it. Now you have to voluntarily come in under his lordship and say, I receive that forgiveness that you offer me. I will live the rest of my life loving you with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength doesn't mean you're perfect as a Christian, but if you're loving him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, then you are a man and woman after God's own heart. That's what he asked us to be. That's what he admired about David. That's what God said about David. A man after my own heart. Perfect? No. Flaws. Plenty of flaws. We all have them. But after God's heart, the greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. So how does that apply to Hebrews chapter 2? He starts by warning us that because children, we're God's children, and we're in this sinful state of the flesh and blood that we inherited from Adam and Eve, and there's no recompense for that. Only the blood of Jesus can wash away that sin. And it's voluntary. You, you don't just get it automatically. You have to submit your surrendering your will to the Lord voluntarily and saying, yes, I recognize that in my state, I cannot save myself. You can save me. So the comparison in Hebrews 2.14 says, because we are made of flesh and blood, the son also had to become flesh and blood. So the first Adam, we know sin in the garden. Jesus is referred in the New Testament as the second Adam. So the second Adam came in our form. Now, I'm just going to take you back to the garden again for a minute. And a lot of you probably have heard me talk about this. We were at a friend's house, and we saw a sculpture. And it was a little hard to understand what it was at first. And, and then I realized it was a picture of Adam being formed out of the dust, which is what it says in Genesis about how God formed Adam, that we are dust. And God breathed life into Adam. Right? So in the garden, there was a perfect man who had never sinned. Once they sinned, there were no people after Adam that had never sinned before. When he was first created, he was a sinless being, dust, flesh and blood with no sin. All through humanity, nobody else met that standard until Jesus came. And that he comes and he's born of flesh and blood. And we know that he doesn't sin. Amazingly, even though he's tempted in every way just like we are, he never sins. So that when he's taken to the cross and he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And it says, he says, it is finished. He gave up the ghost, right? In the old language. He surrendered his spirit to the Father. That was the first time in history a human being lived from birth to death as an adult without sinning. The very plan that God had all along is that we would not have any sin. So by him living that full life and him saying it is finished, he's saying the cycle of death has now been broken because somebody did what God intended all along. They were born, they lived, they died, no sin. That's why he became the perfect sacrifice to us. And that's why there was this ripping open of heaven. <laughs> it was a violent act when Jesus gave up his spirit. The, the, the rocks cracked open. The graves popped open. People came out of the graves because it was like whoosh. Similar to the sound that would happen on the day of Acts, uh, uh, day of Pentecost in the book of Acts, when it says a sound like a mighty rushing wind came. There was a release from heaven when Jesus finished that cycle and said, it is finished. Boom. That was a historic day. No one had ever lived a full life with no sin. We know 50 days later after Passover, that was the day of Pentecost and the Holy Spirit was given. We might be a little surprised when Jesus said to the disciples, it's actually good that I go because if I go, the comforter will come. That's Holy Spirit. Can you just lift your hand and thank God that you have Holy Spirit living in you right now? 
Where would we be without that? If all we had was the law, it says that the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. But the spirit alone won't work without the law. So we have to know the word and be energized by the spirit. So again, I'm still trying to keep you in Hebrews here. There was one way things went. Adam and Eve sinned. Humanity inherited that sin. Now Jesus comes and breaks the grip of death. Because by dying without sin, he defeated the power of death. He rose again, coming out of that grave, meant that the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is now alive in you, if you're a Christian. Because you can't say, Jesus is my Lord, without Holy Spirit energizing that inside of you. A lot of teaching there. But I'll just keep going in Hebrews 2.14. It says, for only as a human being could he die and not only, I'm sorry, and only by dying could he break the power of the devil. Okay? Only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. And this is really what I want you to focus on. Verse 15. Only in this way could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. In another translation, it says, all who are, their whole lives have been tormented by the fear of dying. That is what we're witnessing in the world right now. The panic and the torment of the fear of dying. And I'm not saying that Christians don't have some sense of that fear. We're, we're not people that have a death wish on us. Okay? But what we do have is an eternal perspective of knowing that death has been defeated. That's why in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul could say, Oh, death, where is your sting? Right? Because he understands. And, and you could go back even into church history and find out when the Christians were being brought into the Roman Colosseum to be eaten by lions. They were singing worship songs on the way in because they were so convinced that the resurrection was real that they knew whatever happens to me in this life is just part of the story. Because there's another life coming when this life is over. And just like Jesus rose from the dead and had a new body, we are going to get a new body. We're not going to be playing harps on clouds, okay? The Bible says in Revelation that the new Jerusalem comes back to the earth. And that the saints, we are the saints, are going to rule and reign with him forever. That's what an eternal perspective does. That's what allows you not to be hijacked by fear right now. Because no matter what happens in this life, we still win in the end. But we're going to keep fighting while we're here. We're not going to allow ourselves to be hijacked by this war that's going on. We are going to stand in the midst of the pain of the world and stand in that gap and let people know they don't have to live in this fear of torment of dying. We're the ones with the good news. It's not good advice. It's good news. And they don't know it. <laughs> Only as a human being could he die, and only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Only in this way could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. We also know that the son did not come to help angels. He came to help the descendants of Abraham. That's us. I'm only going to go through a couple more scriptures here, okay? It says on the next slide, stand your ground in the moment of truth. Again, if you've been in our church, you know that I have shared this thought before. But partly what happens when you're in a time of crisis like this is that your root system starts to surface and you realize the things that have really been cornerstone truths. Each one of us has different verses like that. And this is one of them for me. Partly as a worship leader, I've been studying the life of David for a long time. And what the man we're about to read about is one of David's mighty men. And uh, it's from 2 Samuel 23. His name was Eleazar, and it says he was one of the three mighty men with David when they defied the Philistines who were gathered there for battle, and the men of Israel had retreated. Okay, now, this is what the analogy I want to give you, that today we're in a battle, we're in a war, and fear causes you to retreat. But we sang the song, I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. This man isn't singing that necessarily, but he's living it in the way he's acting. I'll just read it again. This man, Eleazar, was one of the three mighty men with David when they defied the Philistines who were gathered for battle. So David brings his army and this mighty man named Eleazar, 
and they're all gathered for battle. But then it says the men of Israel had retreated. This is not who we want to be today. We don't want to be people that retreat. It's a moment of truth time. I don't want you to be foolish. I don't want you to take undue risks. You don't test God, right? We don't throw ourselves off a cliff, it says in the New Testament, because we're going to try to prove when the devil tries to tempt us to do something. No, whatever your faith will allow is what you do, but don't do less than what your faith will allow you to do. And this man had the faith to stand there, even though everybody else was retreating. In his moment of truth, he stood his ground. So not only do I want to tell you that Jesus defeated death, because he did, and you don't have to be tormented by the fear of death. Remember what Paul said, where is your sting? Oh, death, where is your sting? Mm -mm. Jesus defeated it. He said it. Jesus said to Martha, your brother Lazarus will live. Anyone who believes in me will never die. He wants us here on this planet. We are his body. We are his ambassadors. Seek the Lord in this time of trouble. Break off that spirit of calamity and, and terror that's trying to grip your heart. And stand your ground in the moment of truth like this man of God, Eleazar. It says in verse 10, even though the rest of the army was retreating, he arose and attacked the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand stuck to the sword. <laughs> And we know in the New Testament, it says the Bible, the word of God is the sword of the spirit. Boy, is that a great picture or what? His hand became one with the sword. He became one with his weapon. I hope you can become one with your weapon. This is what you need. But why I alluded to Dutch sheets earlier is because it's not a weapon if you just think it. <laughs> it's only a weapon when you say it. The word rhema is the spoken word. So become one with your weapon in the decade of the decree. Speak it out of your mouth. Stand on the promises of God. Memorize scripture. Some of you are spending time with things that aren't redemptive. You have a lot of free time on your hands. Get in the word. I'm going to say it again. There's hundreds of hours of videos right on our YouTube channel who could spend a lot of time going through those videos and looking up the verses and stop it and looking at the transcripts. and Why not? What else are you going to do? So much of the things we do is like chewing gum. It tastes good, but there's no nourishment. Become one with your weapon. This is the bread of life. This is food. This is what will keep you out of that spirit of fear, out of that mindset. When everybody else is panicking, you're standing your ground. In the moment of truth, you become one with your weapon like Eleazar. It's only a short little portion of scripture. It says, his hand stuck to the sword. And what happened? The Lord brought about a great victory that day. This is each one of us each day. You have family members. You have friends. You have people that don't know the Lord that are still subject to that torment of the fear of death. God loves those people. He said he would pour out his spirit on all flesh. So even though they haven't acknowledged it, he said he would pour it out on all flesh. So try to commune with that part of God that's in them and ask the Lord, show me what to say. Show me how I can open my mouth and let packets of life come out of my mouth into the hearts of the people that I'm talking to. This should be the time that many people turn to God because they realize the things they've built their houses on are sinking sand. Jesus said, no. The one who listens and does what I tell him to do is like a man who built his house on a rock. The storm came, the winds blew, everything else was blown down, but that house that was on the rock still stood. People that don't know the Lord have built their house on sinking sand. And you're not good advice. You're good news. You're an ambassador of the kingdom. I'm going to give you a psalm to focus on, and then I'll, I'll wind it down because I see what time it is, 11.05. Not that you have so much to do in your house back there, but anyway, my wife will start texting me. <laughs> psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Wow, could you say that with me? God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Please remember that. Have this one right on the tip of your tongue. Memorize it. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. 
Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling, and I could add in here, though coronavirus is on the move, Selah, that means pause and meditate. It's a song, Selah, because verse 4 is going to be the refrain. No matter what else is swirling around you, everything that can be shaken right now is being shaken. All that swirling, verse 4 says, there's a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. We've been trying to encourage all our folks to take communion daily. This has been going on for a long time now, since my wife had uh, a word at the end of last year as we were crossing into this year. At King of Kings, we always do a fast at the beginning of the year, a 21-day fast, and we got the, the theme that we were going to rebuild our personal altars. What happened to me when I was um, working for a different company, um, I was going to work every morning, and I would do this. I would have communion at my desk. I would get in very early. That was part of my job was to be the first one there because I was writing a market commentary that would go out at 8 o'clock every day. And I had to be there at 6.30. So nobody else was in the office. And I would just kneel at my desk and take communion and sanctify my workspace right there and commit what I was doing that day to the Lord. And then before I would hit send at 8 o'clock when that email had to go out, I would put my hand on the screen and say, Lord, use this, even though it's a secular company and, and it's people that don't know you mostly, not all, but mostly, please use this to get this information out so people will make good decisions about their finances. And I realized that something different happened when I sanctified my space. Something different happened. I don't want to make this into a religious ritual, okay? It's eating the bread and taking the blood. That can be turned into a religious ritual. No, I'm just saying wherever you are, Make it your altar. Take communion in the morning. Start on your knees because that's a position of surrender. And say, Lord, I know I can do nothing without you today, but I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So I'm starting in this position of submission to you because I don't know what the day is going to bring me, but you are going to be there with me as I go through it. And I don't want to default into my flesh mode. I don't want to default into fear mode. I don't want to be influenced by all the swirling around me right now. I want to be locked in to true north on my compass. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. That's the downloads that we receive from heaven. When you make that personal altar and you kneel down and you take communion, there's a river from heaven that's flowing down and that's bringing us life. And we are just like that tree in Psalm 1 that's planted by the rivers of living water that brings forth much fruit in its season. And then in the rest of it, it says, um, the stream, I'm sorry, river whose stream shall make glad the city of our God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. So that's the other thing that's been happening this year is that we've been talking about rebuilding that altar and that our bodies are the tabernacle of the Holy Spirit. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her just, as the, just at the break of dawn. So that's that springing forth of light that comes forth when you tap into the power of God that's already on the inside of you. I would like to just, I'm going to extend my hand towards the camera because I know there's a lot of needs that are represented out there today. And I just want to speak this over the people that are watching right now doesn't matter if you're part of King of Kings or not. It doesn't matter. If you're a Christian, you're part of the body of Christ. And if you're not a Christian, this isn't good advice I'm giving you. This is really good news that you've been hearing today, that you don't have to be tormented by the fear of death. There's a God that loves you, that made you, that has put his spirit on you. You just have to tap into it. He promised to pour out his spirit on all flesh. So if something is resonating about what you're hearing now, it's the truth that's breaking through the lies that have been tormenting you. So say it with me, okay? God is my refuge and strength, a very present help in the present trouble. Therefore, I will not fear, even though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar 
and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling, there is a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God. So, Lord, I just speak that word over every person who's watching right now. Your word says that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy of Holies dwells in the tabernacle of our heart, that where we go, we carry your spirit with us. And we just awaken that stream to flow between heaven and earth. We awaken the bandwidth in our spirit, man, as fear gets broken off right now, as that demonic grip that holds us in fear is broken off by your power. We say that you are very present help right now in the midst of this raging storm that's going on around about us. We speak peace to the storm and the peace of God that passes all human understanding will, will grip you. Just the way the fear tried to grip you, the peace of God is going to grip you. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. No weapon formed against you will prosper. We serve a God who does exceedingly abundantly above all that you can even ask or imagine. So tap into that source. Tap into the rock of Jesus Christ as your firm foundation. I love you all. I'm sorry we can't all be together. I do want to just say a prayer. If there's anybody watching who has never accepted the Lord, the prayer is not so complicated. Just like if you have a child coming to you and, and you know they love you. They don't always know the exact words to say, but you can hear their heart. So it doesn't have to be a big, long, articulate prayer. You can just cry out to God and say, I need help. I'm, I'm not getting it done with the way I've been living. I recognize I've had things out of order that I need to get rid of in my life, and I've been powerless to do that on my own. But I've heard some good news today, not good advice, good news that somebody is willing to take this load off of my life and give me another way to live that will lead to eternal life. So just say this prayer. Heavenly Father, I invite you to come into my life through the name and the power of your son, Jesus. I saw communion today. I never realized the power of the sacrifice of the son of God that he would have died even if I was the only person he sacrificed for me. I don't understand it, but I accept it. I don't even feel like I deserve it. But by faith, I receive your love for me unconditionally. I need you, God. I repent for my sin, and I ask you to save me from my sin. Empower me with your spirit and then encourage me, Lord, every day to love you with all my heart, all my soul, all my strength, and all my might. I can't do it in my own strength. But in Christ, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior for eternal life and for the abundant life that you have for me in this earth. In Jesus' name. We love you, church. We love you, body of Christ. And we're going to still be here. In Jesus' name, God is fighting for us. God is on our side. Amen? So with that, I'm just going to say goodbye until we meet again via live stream. We pray that you all have an awesome day. If you need to communicate with us, you can go on our website. Facebook page, send a message, send an email, and we'll be back in touch with you. Praise God. Have an awesome day.